a brand new episode of the Happy Productive Podcast is about to begin. It's time to be inspired by simple and actionable solutions for you and your business. If you're an established entrepreneur or just laying down the first brick of your future empire, the mantra is the same. We will flip any failure into a positive and use it to our advantage. This show is all about turning coal into diamonds. With the right plan and mindset, anything is possible. I'm Jennifer John, your host, business coach, and founder of Best Planner Ever. And I'm here to help you achieve all your ambitious goals. Success is closer than you think. Let's do this. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Happy Productive Podcast. My beautiful and amazing guest today is Kate De Palma. She's a Stanford graduate and former educator and the founder of Scented Designs, a clean crafted candle company. I know you guys are going to love hearing all about her candles today. Her candles have been in Forbes, Huffington Post, Inc., all over the place. And her mission is to bring health, light and delightful sense to all through scented designs. Welcome Kate to the show. Thanks Jennifer. So excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So just give me a high level. Tell us a little bit about your story. Like how did you come to this place and how did you come to create this company? I love hearing the stories of what led us to starting our companies. I do too, just because they're always all over the place because that's how life is, right? But for me, it was just kind of a hobby I had. Candle making was a hobby. I'm an educator by training. So I was teaching high school English and just started making candles for fun. And you can only make so many candles for yourself and started giving them away as presents and did a couple craft shows because I had loved going to those when I was a kid before Etsy, you know, before Etsy was around. And from there, the business just kind of took off. Like I never planned on starting a business, but once you know, I started it just by doing it really. And then kind of realized, oh, I have a business. Let's see, let's see what I can do with it. (laughs) Oh, wow. And talk to me a little bit about like, I'd love to hear what was one of maybe like the hardest lessons. Cause I, I mean, gosh, people can ask me, it it sounds all nice to be like, I started this great company, but there's always the the backstory and, and the stuff that went on that was like, oh boy, that wasn't very much fun, but I pushed through it. So what was a time in your business that you found to be very challenging? And like, how did you push through that? (laughs) So many times, but (laughs) right. (laughs) The first one I think of is actually, I went back to teaching. I left it once, started the business, ran it full time for a year or two, and then basically freaked out that it wasn't growing the way I thought it quote unquote should. (laughs) Even though other business owners I talked to would say it takes time, you know, that overnight sensation that's not really a reality. You need to give it time. You need to grow your audience. You need to grow your network. You need to learn how to do this. And I just kind of lost faith in myself, if we're being honest. And I went back to teaching and just kind of ran the business as a side hustle at that point. And it was only after another couple of years while I was doing that, it kind of kept sneakily growing and growing and growing that I realized I had to dial back from teaching. So I went part-time for a year and then I left it again entirely. But it took two times. It took twice because I lost faith. I was not confident in myself. And honestly, I wasn't, I think, doing the connections and the education to learn how to run the business. I kind of, like I said, started it out of this love for crafting, but that didn't mean I knew how to run a business. I certainly didn't. And I didn't even know how to go about learning. So that was a process too. Yeah, I'm still learning. (laughs) (laughs) I think we always are. That is, you know, it's so interesting to me because even in the earlier stages of my coaching practice and my software company, when I started that one, there were times where I had a side hustle and I'll have clients come to me now and they just, they're so like, I want to get out of this like corporate job or whatever they're transitioning into. And I'm like, please don't, please don't just go quit that job. Because even in the earlier stages, I had side hustles. Even with this coaching practice, seven or eight years ago, like I 
hired myself out as a contract coach for the Forbes Council and YEC. And I was getting my practice off the ground. And, you know, having that extra income while I was working on getting this business off the ground was so helpful. And so I always think it's super smart when I hear a business owner that, you know, went back to something or did something to generate some income while they were getting their business off the ground because, boy, it's hard enough to get a business, you know, going. And then you add the stress of, you know, not being able to pay bills or the expense of the business. And there's just like so much stress that goes along with there. So I think that was just a super smart move on your part. Totally. When, especially for bootstrap businesses where, yeah, we don't have that funding and you're right, the stress really can play an impact on the decision-making where you're making those decisions for your business out of fear and out of stress rather than what would be the next best move for the business if I weren't worried about those other things. Yeah. And on the flip side, now that the business is established and it's growing, talk to us a little bit of the challenges in running a business that's now growing. What does that look like? Still new challenges every day. (laughs) As a product-based business too, one big issue for us was space and kind of taking that leap from first being a home-based business and then we built a studio in the backyard, quickly outgrew that, finally made the leap into renting out a warehouse space, but that added this whole other overhead to to the business. So just really having to almost go back to basics, kind of that go slow to go fast idea where even though we're growing, even though we're getting bigger, going back to just basics like pricing, are our products priced in a way for us to be profitable given our expenses and keeping track of just supply chain, like trying to navigate through that during COVID was an especially, especially a challenge, which was kind of crazy. So just being open-minded, having to make those pivots when things kind of go awry, and then just always going back to what the numbers are telling us about sales and audience size and traffic and you know, where should we put it, be putting the, the money for marketing and stuff like that. So I would say very similar to early, early stage business, just it's on a different level now. Yeah, absolutely. And so was there any particular challenge in COVID that you guys had to overcome? And I'm curious, like, how did you overcome it? There's so many stories. And even in my business and all of our clients' businesses where they had to pivot make changes. And in many ways, it actually served the business and the business grew. And so I'm just curious, like, was there a particular challenge you had to overcome in COVID? And what did that look like? It's true. We did have to pivot and it did ultimately help us because we did a lot of in-person markets originally. That's kind of how we started. So when COVID shut all those down, we really had to pivot into and lean into e-commerce. And that ultimately is way more scalable. So we built up our website and we weren't just on Etsy. We were working on the actual website and we migrated to Shopify and did a lot to reach new audiences that way. And we were lucky enough to have um, a really strong audience and amazing supporters from the times when we did do in-person stuff. So having that base, staying connected and just finding new ways to work with them that's ultimately, I think, what helped us push through and come out stronger. And just one example I'll give is that we we're located in San Jose, California, so right near a bunch of tech companies such as PayPal. And we had done some in-person markets with PayPal um, prior to COVID and had a couple different collaborations with them. And during COVID, we were able to create holiday gifts for them. Um, to send out to all their employees like nationwide. And that was a, a crazy new challenge for us, but it introduced us to the idea of corporate gifting, kind of gifting in bulk. And that's something we've done a lot of since. And that I don't think would have happened if we hadn't pivoted during COVID. Isn't that interesting? I think no disrespect to anybody who suffered through COVID, but our internal joke is like COVID, you know, the gift that keeps on giving because (laughs) there were so many good things that actually came from it. And like that idea of corporate gifting, like without COVID, you may not have ever even stumbled upon that. So I just love hearing I love hearing that of just like, because of this, we had to pivot and do that. And it ends up being something of value that you can add to your business. Absolutely. 
Very nice. Now, I know that you're a big fan of collaboration. And so tell me a little bit about what does collaboration mean to you and how has that helped you in your day-to-day business? Collaborations are amazing. I would recommend to anyone running a business, look for creative ways that you can partner up and collaborate with other business owners. And the really cool thing about that is that it can be, it can take so many different forms. And I love finding partnerships in the most unexpected of places. And so one of one of my early examples is that a local boudoir photographer reached out asking um, if I would make some custom branded gifts he could give out to clients. And I just thought that was the oddest thing for a boudoir photographer to reach out. And then when I actually made the candles, it made total sense to me because I was able to create this candle that matched his branding. He could give to his clients. It was this like sensory experience during the photo shoot, like totally made sense, but I never thought of it. He did, (laughs) but he kind of opened my eyes to sort of the, all the different businesses like I could collaborate with, for example, as a candle maker, creating branded candles, they could use as client gifts, swag bags, items, all sorts of things. And so I would just encourage listeners like, what can you offer a collaboration? Like, how could you partner with other business owners, whether their service or product, to create a bundle or to do, you know, Instagram lives with each other, to show up on podcasts? Just that visibility boost, the camaraderie of another business owner, and just kind of the value you can add to what you do by incorporating something else without having to like develop a whole new thing yourself. It just, it makes it feel like the sky's the limit. So I love, love, love (laughs) collaborations. Oh, that is so great. And you know, that's such a great tip. And if you're listening, for all the people who are listening, um, one of the ways I learned about collaboration was if you think about the life cycle of your business and all the different other people that they will touch as they work with you. So like we're business coaches. And so when we do work with our clients, they're often maybe working on marketing. And so they might need a designer, they might need a web developer. Um, Then if they are working on their finances, they might need an accountant, they might need a bookkeeper, they might need these things. And so it's about collaborating at those different phases of your business with people who are not competing with you, but it's about collaboration. And so now you guys can cross reference business, cross market, you can do a lot of different things because you're not actually competing, but you're really serving your customer at such a higher level. And yeah, and you know, if I was doing one of those photo shoots, I would want like really good lighting, like candlelight. I look way better in my older years than <laughs> in candlelight than uh, other forms of light. So, um, you know, it's like, hey, let's light several candles and just turn off the lights. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just, it's funny, the things you don't think of, but... Yeah. So you guys just look at the, look at your business. And if you look at all the different points where a potential client could not just interact with you, but other services and products they might need, that is a quick way to just start creating a list of ways that you, or people that you can collaborate with in your business. Exactly. Power partners, I've heard. Exactly. So Kate, tell me a little bit about like time management. Like how do you keep it all together? What's one of your favorite like time management practices that has served you in growing your business and also maintaining good work-life balance? It's a constant uh, growth area, I would say, running a, a business, trying to do it all yourself, but really just learning how and where to delegate. So when I started out, I was a solopreneur, I was doing it all myself, and quickly identifying what are the pieces of the business I don't even really like doing. I'm not good at it. I don't like it. Why am I Why am I doing that? So finding those people, even if it's... What I learned early is that you don't need a, a full-time employee or something like that for it to make a difference. Even just getting that one person to do that one job. So I hired a brand photographer. I hired you know, a bookkeeper, I hired um, a studio assistant just to wick candles. So just even if it's a few hours a week, that of course adds up. And that has really, really helped where I don't feel like I have to do everything, but I don't have to hire a you know full-time employee either. There's so many ways around um, doing that. And 
getting a virtual assistant to help me manage my inbox. So just where are those tasks you don't really like doing that take up a lot of the time that aren't necessarily moving the needle forward. They're just sort of things you have to do to manage the business. And who can you get to help, even if it's just a couple hours a week? That's a great starting point. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite books, Who Not How by Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. Like, it's such a great book. And the concept behind it is, you know, often when we have things that we need to get done, we immediately go, you know, how am I going to get this done? But the question we really want to be asking is who can help me get this done, not how am I going to do it all myself? And I just, I really, really love that concept because you can't, you can get to a certain point in business all by yourself, but then you're going to get to a ceiling and you're going to hit that ceiling and you're not going to be able to really go any further when you just can't do everything yourself. And frankly, you're not good at everything. You shouldn't be doing everything yourself. So I, I love this concept of, you know, who can actually help me get whatever it is done instead of just, you know, how am I going to get it done all by myself? Mm -hmm. I also shout out to you. I just listened to your podcast episode on productivity, where it was do less. <laughs> don't do all the things. So that's I like that too. We don't have to do all the things. What are the couple things? We really don't. And I have found that there is so much more power in simplifying and really pairing it down and not trying to be everything to everybody. Not that I hadn't heard that concept. Of course, I've heard it and had coaches tell me about it, but I never fully embraced it. I'm just like, no, I just want to help. And I just want to do all these things. And, um, and that's fine. But then you get to a point where you're just doing so many things, you find you're not doing all of them as well as you could be. And there's a real power in saying no and focusing your energy and really getting specific about these are the things that we're going to do better than anybody. And it'll actually, you'll like not lose your mind mm -hmm. <laughs> as much um, because you're not so scattered and you're not trying to go in so many different directions. I, I, I would love to hear how that applies or you found that to apply in your business. You know, I finally had to hire an online business manager to help me identify the priorities because I wanted to do all the things. I wanted to sell all the places. So really, she helped me brainstorm, just brain dump all the, the projects I wanted to be working on, create those, you know, 90 day blueprints of, okay, that's great. You want to do everything. What are you actually going to be focusing on over the next three months? And then from there, okay, what's doable? <laughs> each month, you know, what are the smaller tasks within that? But it really, I think, was just being realistic about what my goals were, when I, I wanted to accomplish them, when I needed to accomplish them by, but being realistic and, again, just paring it down to what are the essentials? And I think, too, it's funny, I think back to my teaching days where we would talk about what kind of homework we would assign students. Is it valuable or is it just busy work? So I really like kind of that lens looking at my business, even like the work I'm giving myself, is it valuable? Am I, you know, not learning skills, but am I doing something essential for the business? Or am I just trying to fill the time and feel valuable with busy work? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's so important to do that reflection and to ask yourself those questions. I know for me, it used to be, you know, how many things can I get done today? And I've really had to shift that to what are the right things that I should be getting done today? Um, and it, it shouldn't be 500 things. Like I really try to just focus on what are my top two? What are my top three? And, and once I've gotten those things done, then I can focus on all the quote busy work and the email inbox and, and the client appointments and all of that. But I, I don't know, it just feels like a much more powerful way to work. Um, I feel so much in more in alignment when I just on, honestly lower that bar a little bit. I think there are some people out there that need to raise the bar and you know who you are. If you're like, you're not getting anything done all day, like you know who you are and you need to raise the bar. I, and then I feel like there's the rest of us that every day set that bar so high that we just cannot possibly get all that done. And I think when we kind of bring that down a little bit and sort of find that nice, happy medium where we're moving things forward, we're, we're moving that needle, you know, we're working on the business, not just in it, 
but but then you know but not so much every day that we never feel accomplished or satisfied or it just always feels like you know uh, at the end of the day I didn't do it and we're beating ourselves up like I'd rather like lower that bar a little bit and it took practice it really did it took practice where I'm just like no I'm going to do these things and then I'm going to feel good that I did those things and then that's going to be enough because I found that my health my my physical, my nutrition, like those kinds of self-care things were really just getting shoved aside because I was just so driven and so focused and in the business so many hours a day that it was just like, wait a second, uh, I need fresh air and sunshine and a little bit of movement here. Um, Yeah. So I would love to hear you, like, how did you find that, like you had trouble kind of finding that balance or did it just come naturally to you? Oh, it didn't. Not natural at all. No, it was a struggle, I think, partly because I was coming off of where I was working full time and then running the business on the side. And while that started out kind of fun, right? It was like a creative outlet after work. As it got busier, I just got so used to go, 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 not like not stopping because I was just filling the day with too many things. So I at least recognized that. And, you know, after enough time left the job to run the business full time. But even since then, because I felt like I needed to make up for lost time of, oh, I've been in business now for seven years, technically, but I don't feel like I have been because it hasn't been full time. I think it's just a mindset shift. It's I'm exactly where I need to be. I took the that that path. I met so many amazing people along the way. I don't regret the journey. But kind of realizing that and realizing I don't need to play catch up. I just need to look at where I am now. Where do I want to be three months from now? And just set really manageable, realistic goals of how I can get there. And just know that it's baby steps. And that's okay. (laughs) I'm not going to get it all done today. Yeah. I found that as I slowed down a little bit, it almost seems like things go faster because you kind of like give, I'll call it the universe, you kind of give the universe a chance to sort of like step in and help, like just stuff like answers would, would, would manifest and like people would manifest when I just slowed down a little bit to like give it just a little bit of time to breathe. And it was almost like, oh, the natural order of things could kind of like fall into place when I wasn't so busy just trying to push it all forward and control it. And um, at least that's what I've seen. And it's just like, I still get caught up and like, oh, I got to like push 100 miles an hour. Um, And then remind myself, I try to do it every morning, just remind myself to just slow down, take a breath. It's all going to fall out. Like I'll get it all done. It's, you know, you never actually get it all done. (laughs) I was telling somebody today, I got into a zero inbox uh, last week or the week before. And I was like, yeah, it only took me like 10 years to get to a zero inbox. And then I had to go out to town to speak. And I, so it backed up my schedule for like two days. And I'm like, oi, like now I'm backed up on emails again. So it's like, you never really ever catch up. There's always going to be things. So I think it's way better to just find that, make peace with that and just kind of find that rhythm that for you feels good. And it can't just always be like, oh, I've got to get it all done every day. Mm, Probably not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. And I'll say one other <laughs> one other tip that I at least incorporate because it made such a difference is shutting down the the inbox, closing the email tab, not checking it, you know, having a finite times. So I'm going to check it once in the morning, I'm checking it once in the afternoon and then devoting time to answer it. Cuz originally I would be checking it every 5 minutes and I would stop and drop everything to respond to that email inquiry cuz I'm like, "Oh, they need to hear back from me. I got to do this." No. They can wait. And it just was so disruptive to the other tasks I was trying to work on. Kind of like my phone too, right? I put that on do not disturb because all it takes is one little, we're like conditioned, I think almost to, you know, even if we're in the middle of something to answer it. And that is just so disruptive to our productivity. So that was a big game changer for me was then to be able to batch those email responses instead of having them be disruptions. Oh, I love that so much. I swear, like when I first started kind of like, I'm not going to answer my emails for the first couple hours or whatever. It's almost like you go into a panic attack. It's like, guys, I promise the world turns, the sun comes up. 
if you don't answer your email inbox for a couple of hours while you get some stuff done and then all that stuff is there. And even sometimes when I respond like super fast, people are like shocked because they're just like, oh my God, I didn't expect you to respond so quickly. And it's like, right, we're setting these false expectations for ourselves that other people are not even putting on us. Mm -hmm, Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right, my dear Kate, thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, First, I would love for you to share where everybody can find your beautiful, amazing candles. Thanks, Jennifer. My company is called Scented Designs Candle Company, and our website is scenteddesigns.com. And we would love to see you over there. Wonderful. All right, you guys. So everybody head over to Kate's website, Scented Designs. We will absolutely put the link in the show notes if you want to go check her out. And you're all business owners. So if you're looking for a very creative corporate gifting idea, I know um, I'm like, hmm, this would actually make a great corporate gift. So (laughs) So you guys definitely head over there and check out her candles. Kate, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks, Jennifer. Really loved it. Oh, great. Awesome. All right, you guys, that's it for today's show. Get out there and have a happy, productive day. Bye, y'all. I hope you found today's episode of the Happy Productive Podcast inspiring. Every successful business is formed by a set of small, consistent, and attainable steps. If you want to learn more, come visit us at jenniferdawncoaching.com to take your next step and learn how to meet your business goals. On our website, you're going to find free resources along with links to the life-changing coaching programs that have transformed the lives of so many of our clients, including the Coaching Academy and our Unbreakable Retreats. Many of them started their journey by listening to this podcast. That's it. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.